Tonight we want to continue our series on racing to Revelation. And in our first three studies, we've asked and answered the questions, what on earth is God, oh, excuse me, what on earth is going to happen in the future? Secondly, why must Jesus Christ come again? And then last time, what is the correct method for interpreting prophecy? Now tonight we want to discover what is the key to understanding the apocalypse or the book of Revelation. And so let me invite you to open your Bibles with me to the book of Revelation, Revelation chapter 1. Revelation chapter 1. Tonight we want to work our way verse by verse through Revelation chapter 1. And in doing so, we want to examine the prologue of the book of Revelation, the person of the book of Revelation, and lastly, the particular outline of the book of Revelation. And like most significant books, the book of Revelation has a prologue at the beginning and an epilogue at the end. So let's begin by simply reading the prologue. Verse 1, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants things which must shortly take place. And he sent and signified it by his angel to his servant John, who bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ to all things that he saw. Blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of this prophecy, and keep those things which are written in it, for the time is near. John, to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come, and from the seven spirits who are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler over the kings of the earth, to him who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood and has made us kings and priests to his God and Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Behold, he is coming with clouds, and every eye will see him, even they who pierced him. And all the tribes of the earth will mourn because of him. Even so, amen. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, says the Lord, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. Now, as we begin to seek to understand the book of Revelation, we recognize in the prologue here that, like many books, this book has a title. Now, in some Bibles, if you look up on the title, margin on the first page of this book, it would say, The Revelation of St. John the Divine. And I'm not sure who really thought of that, but that's really not the title of this book. We see from verse 1 that the title of this book is none other than the Revelation of Jesus Christ. Now that word, Revelation, is worth commenting on. It is the Greek word, apocalypsis, and it speaks of the unveiling, the disclosure, the revelation of Jesus Christ. If you notice closely, it is singular, not revelations, but revelation. It is not plural. For you see, this is one great continual revelation of Jesus Christ. And in this book, Jesus Christ is unveiled as the Lord of the church, the Messiah of Israel, and the judge and king of the earth. He is unveiled in Revelation so that we would walk away not impressed with the details of what will happen in the future, but far more than that, that we would walk away impressed with none other than Jesus Christ. For you see, this book is a revelation. It is not 
designed to be misunderstood. It's not designed to be neglected. It is not the concealment of Jesus Christ. It is the revelation of Jesus Christ. And it's interesting for a man named G.R. Beasley Murray in the New Bible Commentary says, regarding this book, it has been sadly ignored in many circles. Unfortunately, that's true. In fact, over the history of the church, the book of Revelation has been ignored by many. In fact, in the Reformation, reformers like the early Luther would have none of it. The revered John Calvin refused to write a commentary on it, and Zwingli did not think it was a true book of the Bible. From the earliest ages of the church, it has been universally admitted that the Apocalypse, the book of Revelation, is the most difficult book of the entire Bible to understand. David Larson writes, and I quote, We have always had to contend with the know-nothings, like Glog, who argue that no one knows what Revelation means, or Martin Kittle, who wrote on Revelation for the Moffat Commentaries, who maintained that, quote, Revelation is full of obscurities. The book is so strange as to become meaningless. Scholars are lost in the maze. Visions are tinged with incoherencies so that much of the book appears incapable of reasonable explanation. Such fantasies and incoherent contradictions, intentionally cryptic. He goes on to say the first readers had the master key which unlocked the mysteries. We have lost the key. And then he goes on to write 460 pages of a commentary on the book. Dear friends, have we lost the key? I mean, did God give us a book from the, in the Bible and he wants us to know about Jesus Christ and then he threw away the key for everyone to, you know, just kind of be hoping we find it, maybe. That is not our God. In fact, I am convinced he wants us to know the truth more than we want to know it. And we will see tonight the key. I believe in understanding the book of Revelation. But notice that this book has a purpose. And the purpose of this book, according to verse 1, is to show his servants things which must shortly take place, which must quickly or speedily take place. And the word must is our Greek word day. Again, it speaks of something of absolute necessity. Now, what are some of these things that the book of Revelation tells us that must shortly take place? Well, as we think of the book of Revelation, we again will recognize and we will spend some time on the fact that after Revelation chapter 3, that we no longer find the church except in heaven for that whole period of time called the tribulation. Because the rapture of the church has occurred, the church is in heaven, and the tribulation will break out on earth in chapters 6 through 18. This is some of the things that must shortly come to pass. We recognize in Revelation chapter 5 that Jesus Christ is going to come forth, and he's going to take the scroll, the title deed of the earth, and reclaim this planet for God. For it was lost as the scepter was given to Adam, and he forfeited it to Satan when he gave into that temptation in the Garden of Eden, so that Satan could rightfully put before the Lord Jesus in Matthew 4, that if you would bow down to me, I will give you the kingdoms of the earth, which he would have no possibility of giving unless he was the God of this world, which Satan is. And so, as Jesus Christ starts to unravel the title deed of the earth, which is sealed with these seven seals, the first seal breaks, and out comes the horsemen of the apocalypse. And from there comes the seal judgments that occur, which we will look at in detail in the future. Now, if these weren't bad enough, and many people die during the seal judgments, then come the trumpet judgments. And before it's all over, then come the bowl judgments. So by the time we're done, some three-quarters of the world is dead. If you do your math, even right now, as there's six to seven billion people on the earth, just imagine five and a half billion people dying 
over the next seven years. Wouldn't that be amazing? I said before, if you're not saved, you need to become a, a mortician because you're going to have a lot of business in the tribulation to come. You know, as we study prophetic things in the book of Revelation and we tie them in to Ezekiel 38 and 39, we see that there's going to be this rise of Islam and there's going to be this confederation of Arabic, Islamic countries that are going to attack Israel. I believe right before the midpoint of the tribulation. And indeed, we are seeing this very thing in our day. We recognize the revelation is going to set forth the rise of the one world church who rides on the back of the Antichrist as they both work in collusion for a period of time until the Antichrist turns on that false ecumenical church and destroys it, robs it of its wealth. We know from Revelation chapter 13, there's the unholy trinity of Satan, the Antichrist, and the false prophet. We know that with the rise of the Antichrist will become the mark of the beast, in which everyone will have to have something on their forehead or on their hand in order to buy and sell. And we see that there's this, again, global coming together, which increasingly we are seeing in our very day. And dear friends, it is frightening in a sense as the stage is being set. And instead of even individuals in the United States thinking nationally, they think globally, even on a presidential level, in which they would be willing to give up the sovereignty of the United States and put it under the UN or something like that. I am very concerned about the direction of our country. And I am thankful that my refuge is God and his word. We know that the book of Revelation sets forth that there's going to come a time when all the armies of the earth are going to um, come to the Middle East for the battle or military campaign of Armageddon. And we know that Jesus Christ is going to return and destroy the armies of the world. And then there will be the wedding supper of the Lamb in which Satan then is bound for a thousand years in the bottomless pit. And then there is the resurrection of the just to enjoy the kingdom that God had long promised on this earth. A kingdom on earth that begins with its first stage being 1,000 years before it goes into the eternal state. And we know as we think of the eternal state after the great white throne judgment, that there's great blessing for the believer and yet great torment for the unsaved as they'll be cast into the lake of fire to be tormented day and night forever and ever. We know the book of Revelation tells us about the new Jerusalem, this holy city that's going to come out of heaven and plant itself on the earth, in which I personally believe will be the home of the church throughout the ages. And there will be the new heavens and the new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness. And dear friends, that isn't going on now. This is the devil's world right now. And yet God has his ambassadors for Christ. And one day we're going home. And we know that as we think of God's prophetic plan, that everything is running right on schedule. And in fact, this world is going to hell in a handbasket. And that's why we're not to love the world, neither the things that are in the world. That's why we're to set our mind on things above, for we're in Christ and we're ascended with him. We're to seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And we're to remember for us to live as Christ and to die as gain. You see, there's a purpose for writing this book. And the purpose, again, is that God wants to show his servants things which must shortly take place. And indeed, he doesn't give us all the details, but he gives us more than we can swallow in the book of Revelation. Now, as we think of the transmission of this book, we recognize that this book came from God the Father to Jesus Christ, to an angel, to John, and then to us. 
Verse 1 again reminds us the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants. Notice, God gave Jesus Christ to show his servants things which must shortly take place. And he sent and signified it by his angel to his servant John, who then wrote it to us. You see, as we think of the transmission of the book of Revelation, it was God the Father who gave it to Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ gave it to an angel. The angel then communicated it to John, and John gives it to us. You say, is it really to us? Look at chapter 2 with me for a moment in verse 7. As he writing to the church of Ephesus, he says, He who has an ear, let him hear. What the Spirit says to the churches. You have an ear? Then you need to hear what the Spirit saying to the churches. Verse 11. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Notice it's going beyond the seven churches to those who have an ear. Verse 17. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. You see, the book was not only written to the seven churches, but then it was to be spread around and passed around so others would read it like we're reading it tonight and find great value in this book. But in doing so, we recognize the authenticity of this book, for it is called in verse 2, the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. You see, John bore witness, verse 2, to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ to all things that he saw. Now, he saw it. It was a revelation. It wasn't the product of some wild imagination. In fact, the word I saw or I heard is found over 60 times in this book. It's called the Word of God. It's the Word that originates from God. It's called the testimony of Jesus Christ. Sounds authentic, for it is. Sounds authoritative, for it is. And in doing so, as we think of the Bible, you know, apart from just studying the Scriptures and being taught it well, you know, there's just like a bunch of puzzle pieces that don't quite fit together. You see them, but you don't know how they fit until a clear understanding of the Scriptures rightly divided comes into play. And then pretty soon, oh, that's where that fits, and that fits there, and that fits there. And you see, as we think of even the Old Testament, it's all pointing to Jesus Christ, all pointing to the fact that one day He's going to come. And yet we know in His first coming, only a hundred and some prophecies were fulfilled of the over 300 that were made. And we know that Christ is now building his church. But upon the rapture of the church, all the focus goes back to Israel. And the fulfillment of those covenants and the fact that Jesus Christ is going to come again, just like as was predicted. And thus... We see that this book is authentic, this book is authoritative, and this book has a promise connected to it. David, can you go see if someone put a battery in this for me, please? Thank you. Verse 3 gives us the promise. Blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written in it, for the time is near. Now, the word reads, the word hear, the word keep is, are all in the present tense. Blessed is he who keeps on reading, keeps on hearing, keeps on keeping. And the word keep really means to take to heart. You know, you need to take to heart what the Word of God says. You need to believe it and take it to heart. Because we're not here looking at something that's just kind of really neat and cool and sci-fi. And, you know, that now that X-Files is done, we get to read Book of Revelation or something, you know. No, no, no. This is, this is the real thing. 
And by the way, notice, blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of this prophecy. The words, because you see, every word of God is inspired by God. Now, does this sound like a book that should be neglected? Not at all. Now, you say, well, why does he say, blessed is he who reads and those who hear? Well, remember, in the early church, not everyone had a Bible. In fact, very few had Bibles. And as a result, someone would get up and read this book, and he was blessed by reading it. There were those who heard it, and they would be blessed by hearing it. And both would be blessed if they would take it to heart in light of what was said. And, you know, as I think of that, I can't help but think about the great privilege you and I have of owning our own Bible. I would like to ask you a question. Do you read it? Do you read the Word of God? Isn't it funny how you have time to watch this or listen to that? But do you just take time to just read the Word of God? Do you take time to listen to the Word of God? Do you take the Word of God to heart? You see, Revelation begins with a promise here in chapter 1 and verse 3. But by the way, interesting enough, it also ends with a promise. So put a marker, a hand there or something, and go back to Revelation chapter 22. Verse 3 was, blessed is he who reads and so forth. Revelation 22, verse 7, Behold, I am coming quickly, blessed. Here it is again. It's he who keeps the words of the prophecy of this book, who takes these truths to heart. So it begins with a promise and it ends with a promise. Amazing book, but true. Now, this book, by its very nature, is called a prophecy. Verse 3, blessed is he who reads and those who keep the words of this prophecy. And the word prophesia is found in seven times in the book of Revelation. A prophecy was the receiving of direct revelation from God and therefore giving it out. It was, could involve foretelling by way of prediction or foretelling by way of pronouncement. But it always re involved direct revelation from God. Now, we saw last time we studied together some of the prophecies that were fulfilled in Christ's first coming. And we know the probability of these being fulfilled was astronomical. Proving once again what we have in this, our hands tonight is nothing other than the word of God. We also noted the fact, very importantly, that when it comes to prophecy, we are to interpret it the same way we interpret any part of Scripture in a normal, grammatical, historical, contextual way using usual language or explained symbols. And that is true with this prophecy of the book of Revelation. And just like the prophecies were fulfilled in the Old Testament regarding Christ's first coming, God cannot lie, and they will also be fulfilled in Christ's second coming as well. In fact, verse 3 tells us again, blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written in it. Why? For the time is near. The importance of this book is because the time is near. And by the way, if it was near then, what must it be now? You know, only God knows his own prophetic clock. And frankly, I am just amazed that we're still here. You know, when I was saved in 1973 by the grace of God at the age of 18, I never thought I would see 2008. Never. Never thought I'd see 2000. In fact, I didn't think our country would even be around. I was so disheartened 
1979 and so forth, where everything was moving in our country. I was so discouraged in the sense that I thought there was no hope for the U.S. You know, I'm starting to feel the same way again. But you know what encourages me is the fact that the Lord is the one who has the clock. And the Lord is the one who's in control, and he is my refuge. And yet, as you look at the sign of the times, and you begin to look at some of these things, you see that many things are in place or getting in place for the fulfillment of Scripture. We see, again, Israel's in the land where they need to be in the fulfillment of Scripture, for they're going to be attacked. We see the rise of Russia. We see capital and labor conflict. We see increase in travel and knowledge, just like Daniel 12.4. We see apostasy growing over and over again, occultism. We have scoffers, a moral breakdown in our world, a one-world church being built, a one-world government. I mean, not that we are date-setters or such, but let's face the reality that the stage is being set for what we know is going to certainly come to pass and find its fulfillment as set forth in the book of Revelation. But you know, as we think of the book of Revelation, as Genesis commences with the creation of the heavens and the earth, man and wife, rivers, the tree of life, paradise lost, with the entrance of sin, the rise of Babel, death and exclusion. When it comes to the book of Revelation, God's book of outcomes, it caps off the Holy Scriptures with the new heaven and the new earth, the last Adam and his bride, the river of the water of life, paradise regained in the garden city of God, the doom of Babylon, life and reconciliation for the Lord's own, eating more than restored, and we marvel again at the perfection and the beauty and the genius of Holy Scripture. No wonder Satan and his minions hate the book of Revelation. For it sets forth their doom and destruction and the glory of God. And we do well to study this book. Now we're told in verse 4 who the writer of this book is, the human writer. John. He says it again in verse 9. I, John. He's the apostle John who wrote the gospel of John. First, second, and third John. In the book of Revelation, I think volume-wise more than any writer in the New Testament. And we know that the recipients of this book were the seven churches of Asia Minor. We're told that in verse 4. John to the seven churches which are in Asia Minor. They are mentioned by name in verse 11 when we get that. Now you say, well, where is Asia Minor? Well, Asia Minor would be modern-day Turkey. As the gospel spread in the early church, it spread to this area. And as a result, people were saved, churches were established. And this book was written to the seven churches of Asia Minor. Now this book also has a greeting attached to it. Verse 4, John to the seven churches which are in Asia... Grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come. That's the Father, God the Father. And from the seven spirits who are before his throne. That's a inference to Isaiah chapter 11 and the sevenfold ministry of the Holy Spirit connected with the Messiah. Verse 5, and from Jesus Christ. Now notice the order, grace and peace. And again, that's always the order, for apart from grace, could we ever have peace? Apart from the grace of God, would we ever have peace with God? And apart from the grace of God, could we ever enjoy as believers the peace of God? And apart from grace, would we ever see peace on the earth? Now, this grace and peace comes from, and there's three prepositional phrases, with the preposition apo, the preposition of source in the Greek text that tells us that this greeting comes from the Trinity. From the Father, from the Spirit, and from the Son. 
And we understand that in the unity of the Godhead, there are three distinct persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And all three have an important role to play when it comes to the book of Revelation. Now, if you are a book lover like I am, in fact, even with the Internet, I still like the feel of a book in my hand. That sometimes as you open a book, you read that this book is dedicated to so-and-so and so-and-so. You know, when I was growing up in the 60s and 70s, you know, the age of rock instead of the rock of ages, that the mamas and the papas had a song called uh, Dedicated to the One I Love. But you know what's interesting is the book of John also has a dedication. And that dedication is found in verse 5. To him who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood and has made us kings and priests, to his God and Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Notice that this book is dedicated to who? To Jesus Christ. And how is Jesus Christ described there in verse 5? He's described as the faithful witness. That speaks of his credibility. His reliability. You can trust what he has to say. He's described as the firstborn from the dead. In other words, through his resurrection, he is the first in rank. This establishes his superiority. And thirdly, he's called the ruler over the kings of the earth. And this underscores his sovereignty. He is king of kings and lord of lords, and one day he will prove that to the entire world. You know, the question on many people's minds tonight is, who's going to win? Now, if you're a baseball fan, you might be asking, who's going to win the World Series? Is it the Phillies or the Rays tonight? If you are involved in the political field, you might be asking, who's going to win the election? Obama or McCain? But in the theological realm, the real question is, who's going to win, God or Satan? And the book of Revelation makes it clear, Jesus Christ wins. He's not going to lose. Now, that doesn't mean Satan believes it, though he knows it. In fact, he knows this book better than you and I know it. And he knows his doom and he knows his destiny. But so might a cat that's stuck in a corner. But it doesn't mean he's not going to come out scratching and hoping for the best. You see, this book is dedicated, dear friends, to Jesus Christ. Now, what has Jesus Christ done for us? Well, we're told right there, to him who loved us. Now, just stop and think about that for a minute. He loved us. Now, the more you're growing in grace, the more you should be sensing your own depravity as well. The more you're growing in grace, the more you should realize how awesome the Lord is and what an idiot you are. And that's putting it nicely. That you are prone to go astray. You are prone to be self-dependent. You are prone to pride. You are prone to this, and too often you are. And so am I. But to think that he loves us. He loved us enough to send his son to die for us. And in this case, it's Jesus Christ who loved us. And he not only loved us, but he washed us from our sins. You see, man has a problem. It's called sins. Now, that's something that's not in the vocabulary of the average American. That's something you won't hear in public school, usually. Sins. You know, you say, well, I think the problem with mankind is sin. It's like, you mean not low self-esteem? Not that we don't have a golden garbage can in everyone's yard? like the socialists of today would like us to have? I mean, that's not man's problem. No, it's sins. And we need those sins washed away. It's a great analogy for forgiveness. Washed away. And that 
The sins are washed away only through one means, the blood of Jesus Christ. His blood speaks of his vile and death, the fact that on Calvary's cross he died and paid for our sins. That he died not only spiritually, physically, but he died spiritually. He bore the equivalent of hell for us, and he gave his life so that we could have our sins washed away. And not only that, he has made us kings and priests to his God and Father. I mean, have you lost the wonder, dear friends, of how the Lord loves you and what Christ has done for you? You know, you think again of the destiny we deserve, the hell we deserve, and how the only way from earth to heaven, as it were, is through the cross. And how Jesus Christ loved us. How Jesus Christ shed his blood. How Jesus Christ wants to forgive us. And the moment we put our faith in Jesus Christ alone, our sins are washed away because they've been paid for by him in full at Calvary. Amazing but true. But how sad on the other hand. On the one hand, we rejoice tonight that our sins have been washed away as believers, but those without Christ, their sins have been paid for but not washed away. And many are being hurled right down into an eternal hell. You see, this book, dear friends, is dedicated to none other than Jesus Christ. And what is he worthy of in light of who he is and what he's done? We're told at the end of verse 6, To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. To him be glory, be praise, and be worship. And the book of Revelation is filled with that to Jesus Christ. He's worthy of dominion, and one day he will reign, rule on this planet. And he's worthy of glory, and he's worthy of dominion for how long? Forever and ever. And what should our response be? Amen. Amen. So what is the book of Revelation about? What is its theme? The theme of this book centers around the truth that Jesus Christ is coming again. He is coming again. We read in verse 7, Behold, he is coming with clouds, and every eye will see him. You know, when John wrote that, I'm, I'm, I'm I bet he wondered how that could be true. Yeah, we don't have any trouble understanding how it could be true now, right? Every eye will see him. Even they who pierced him. By the way, who are those who pierced him? It's the Jews. The Jews pierced him. And all the tribes of the earth will mourn because of him. Even so, amen. You know, one day Jesus Christ is coming again. And we know that in that tribulation period that the nation of Israel will turn to the rightful Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. They will accept him, though in his first coming they rejected him. And that they will accept him And he will come back in all his second coming glory to fulfill the promises made to Israel. Now, I have said this before, and it bears repeating again. God has made it clear, I will bless them that bless Israel and curse them that curses Israel. And that's why even when the Islamic nations attack Israel, right before the midpoint of the tribulation, according to Ezekiel 30 and 39, They are so utterly and absolutely destroyed by a miracle of God, apart from human help, by way of a great earthquake and by way of disease and by way of uh, the confusion of the troops probably shooting on each other, dying a friendly fire, so that there are carcasses everywhere and, and there's battle armament that will be burned for seven years, we're told. Why does that happen? I will bless them that bless you and curse them that curse you. And I've said before, one of the reasons why the United States is still afloat is because of our pro-Israeli policy. 
And I am very concerned. As we think of even our presidential candidates and where they stand in that regard. You see, Zechariah 12.10 tells us, then they will look on me whom they pierced. Yes, they will mourn for him as one who mourns for his own son. And so the book of Revelation is about what? Jesus Christ and about the fact that he is coming again. Verse 8 says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, says the Lord, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. Jesus Christ is coming again, dear friends, but how is this different from his first coming? Again, remember, he came as the Lamb of God to take away the sin of the world in his first coming. He comes the second time as the line of the tribe of Judah, the root of David. He came at his first coming to offer a sacrifice. He will come at his second coming as sovereign king. You see, even as we think of his first coming, he rode into Jerusalem on the foal of an ass. But in his second coming, he's going to come on a white horse. And remember, the white horse was analogous to the Roman general who would lead the procession in a white horse because victory was his. Such will be true when Jesus Christ comes again. And so we've looked thus far tonight at the prologue of the book of Revelation. We've gathered some key details that we need to know if we're going to understand this book. But what verses 9 through 18 now seek to impress upon us is the person of the book of Revelation. And again, he's none other than Jesus Christ. Verse 9, I, John, both your brother and companion in the tribulation, and kingdom, and patience of Jesus Christ was on the island that is called Patmos. Why were you there, John? For the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. That's why I was there. Now, John was being persecuted. And by virtue of his testimony for Jesus Christ and his his willingness to contend for the word of God, He was exiled to the Isle of Patmos in the Aegean Sea. And there he was. And while he was there, Satan probably (laughs) took that apostle out of commission. There he writes the book of Revelation. You know, it's just like Paul, when he would get thrown in prison, he probably thought, ha, it stopped him now. No, he just led guards to Christ and prisoners to Christ and wrote some very important prison epistles. You see, isn't it good to know that as a believer, all things work together for good? Verse 10. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard behind me a loud voice as of a trumpet, saying, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and last letters of the Greek alphabet. I am the beginning. I am the first and the last. And what you see... This is what I want you to do, Jesus Christ told him. I want you to write in a book and send it to the seven churches which are in Asia, to Ephesus, to Smyrna, to Pergamos, to Thyatira, to Sardis, to Philadelphia, and to Laodicea. Now, as we think of the person of the book of Revelation, we see the setting for this vision of Jesus Christ here in verses 9 and 10. It's John on the island of Patmos because he's being persecuted for his testimony. He's on the, in the spirit, and the Lord speaks to him and tells him to write this book and to send it to the seven churches of Asia Minor. We move from the setting up for this vision to the description of this vision of Jesus Christ. Verse 12, then I turned to see the voice that spoke with me. And having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. Candlesticks, lampstands. They may have been like, uh, what am I thinking of? Uh, 
candelabras, you know, menorahs in nature. Verse 13, and in the midst, in the middle of the seven lampstands, one like the Son of Man. He was clothed with the garment down to the feet and girded about the chest with a golden band. And gold oftentimes in the Bible speaks of deity. But he's the Son of Man, and yet he's God. His head and his hair were white like wool and white again, oftentimes in Scripture, speaks of purity and holiness. He's without sin. As white as snow. And his eyes were like a flame of fire. And his feet were like fine brass, as if refined in a furnace. And his voice is the sound of many waters. And he had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was like the sun shining in its strength. We see here a description of what John not only heard, but also what he saw. And as we think of what John saw, we have something like this in front of us. We see that John saw this vision of the resurrected Christ, God, but man, pure without sin, eyes as a flame of fire, speaking of judgment again. For you see, oftentimes you hear the statement, well, in the Old Testament, God was more like a judge, but in the New Testament, he really doesn't judge. Not true. Though it's true that Grace abounds in the New Testament. And yet we see that Jesus Christ, when he comes again, he's a judge. And in the meantime, he's even a judge. He's going to be walking in the midst of the seven golden lampstands, and he's going to be evaluating, commending, and critiquing as Lord of the church. Here he is. Now what does this teach us again about Jesus Christ? It teaches, first of all, he's alive. He's alive. It teaches us that he is God. He is man. It teaches us that he is holy, he is pure. It teaches us that he judges and evaluates. And he knows what is going on. It teaches us when he speaks, his voice this is the sound of many waters. He speaks with great authority. And having seen this vision, how does John respond? Well, first of all, we see in verse 17, And when I saw him, number one, I fell at his feet as dead. Now, dear friends, this is not uncommon in the New Testament to have this kind of response, or in the Old Testament, when someone came into contact visually with God. You know, some people have such a low view of God and a high view of themselves, they think if they see God, they're going to walk up and, hey, give me a high five, how you doing, big guy? You know, I want you to know that is not the case. No, when they get a sense of the holiness of God, they immediately get a sense of their own sinfulness. That's why Isaiah said, Oh, Lord, I, woe is me. In other words, I'm cursed. I've had it. I'm dead meat. That would be the idea. Why does he say that? He says, oh, because I'm a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. Do you remember when Jesus stills the storm that the disciples in the boat immediately were shattered in the sense, whoa, we had a sense that he is God, but whoa, we've got a greater sense of it. And immediately they wanted to flee. You see, when John sees the description of Jesus Christ, he immediately fell at his feet, dead. Now we know that oftentimes a sign of humility is falling at someone's feet. And he fell, his feet is dead. I mean, you know, 
When you, you fall as dead, you're, you're shook big time. And I love how the Lord responds to him. For how does the Lord respond to John? Verse 18. And he laid his right hand on me, saying to me, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am he who lives and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And I have the keys of Hades and of death. First thing he says is, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. I mean, the Lord Jesus said that many times. He said, don't be afraid. Now, in order to not be afraid, you'd have to what? Believe that. <laughs> right? You'd have to believe that. Don't be afraid. In other words, relax. Don't be afraid. Trust me. Trust me. You know, in your tribulations, your difficulties, your fears, you know what the Lord is saying? Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Get your eyes off that and get your eyes on me. Trust me. Faith rests in me. I am the first and the last. I am he who lives and was dead. Notice, speaking of his what? Is his death, first of all, I am he who was dead, reminding us again that he died. We know he died for our sins. And that he now lives, he's resurrected from the grave. And behold, I am alive forevermore. He ascended right into heaven, never to taste death again. Amen. And I have the keys of Hades and of death. Now, this is a verse of times that I've used with Jehovah Witnesses to point out the fact, I'll just ask them, you know, I take them through Isaiah 44 and 45 and say, you know, who's the first and the last and the first and the last? And they'll say, Jehovah, Jehovah, Jehovah. And then you bring them here, I am the first and the last. Who is he? They'll say, it's Jehovah. And then verse 18 says... I am, a, I am he who lives and was dead. And I ask, now when did Jehovah die? And they'll say, well, Jehovah didn't die. Jesus died. I say, yes, unless Jehovah and Jesus are the same. And by the way, they try to argue, terribly so, that there's a break between verses 17 and 18, that it's God the Father speaking in verse 17, and Jesus Christ speaking in verse 18. But there's no reason to do that. I am he who lives and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And I love it. You know who says amen there isn't John. It's Jesus Christ. Amen. In other words, this is a faithful saying. This is true. And I have the keys of Hades and of death. Can I just make a practical application for you and me? Who's got the keys? Jesus Christ has the keys. And until he puts it in that door and turns it, you're immortal. He's the one who has the keys. My times are in his hands. He has the authority over Hades and he has the authority over death. Amazing but true. And I'm sure glad he has it. Aren't you? In fact, he gives eternal life as a gift to all who put their faith in him. And so we've seen the prologue of the book of Revelation. We've seen the person of the book of Revelation. It's all about Jesus Christ. Christ. And we end tonight looking at the particular outline of the book of Revelation. And I am convinced if we understand this prologue, we recognize the person of the book of Revelation, and we have in hand this particular outline of the book that we have every reason to think, by the grace of God and through the Spirit of God, that we have the key to understanding the book of Revelation. And I just love how 
Though sometimes the key verse of the book is on the back porch, in this case, it's on the front porch. It's found in verse 19. Write the things which you have seen, and the things which are, and the things which will take place after this. Now, first of all, he says, write the things which you have seen. That refers to what chapter? Chapter 1, what he's just seen in which he's just written for us. Second key, and the things which are, refers to chapters 2 and 3, the seven churches that he's going to write to that we'll be looking at next Wednesday night in very fast fashion. And then, and the things which will take place after this refers to chapters 4 through 22. You say, are you sure about that? Well, look at chapter 4 with me, verse 1. And this really comes out in the Greek text, but it even can be seen in the English text. How does verse 19 end? The things which will take place after this. Chapter 4, verse 1, after these things, I looked and behold a door standing open in heaven, and the first voice which I heard was like a trumpet speaking with me, saying, come up here, and I will show you things which must take place after this. So we know that the after this is chapters 4 through 22. You see, if we were to look at the book of Revelation tonight, by way of its outline, it's just right here. We see the things that he has seen, chapter 1, the vision of Christ, the things which are present, the seven churches of Asia Minor, and the things which shall be hereafter. And that's the threefold division of the book of Revelation. And if you keep that in mind, it helps you immensely in understanding this book. In fact, the book of Revelation really breaks down just like we normally chart an average dispensational outline, in which, again, we see the resurrected Christ, chapter 1 there, the church, chapters 2 and 3, the church in heaven, starting in chapter 4 through 19, uh, into 19, the tribulation on earth, chapters 6 through, well, 18, 19 ends it. Christ then comes back, chapter 19, the Messiah's kingdom, chapter 20. Then there's the last judgment, end of 20. New heavens and new earth, 21 and 22. There's a reason why. This wasn't just randomly thrown together by someone who, you know, had too much pizza one night and got a vision somewhere. That, that this, there's a reason why we chart this the way we do. And again, this is the key outline to the book. Now, there's one other question that remains in light of what we've seen. Namely, what does the seven stars and the seven lampstands refer to that he mentioned there in verses 12 and 13 in this vision of Christ? Well, verse 20 tells us the answer. The mystery of the seven stars which you saw in my right hand and the seven golden lampstands, the seven stars are the angels or the messengers we'll talk more about this next time, of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands which you saw are the seven churches. You see, as we think of this resurrected Christ and the vision John has of him, he's going to, in chapters 2 and 3, say he's walking in the midst of each of these churches, of Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamos, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, Laodicea. And that each of these churches are likened to a lampstand. And that there was an angel or a messenger sent to each of these churches with a particular message for them. And who I'm reminding in this, that, you know, when it's all said and done, the question we have to ask ourselves as a believer is, have I lived my life for the glory of Christ have I lived my life through the power of the Spirit? 
Have I lived my life by faith and seeking to do the will of God with a recognition that I am an ambassador for Christ and just like each church should be a lampstand that reflects the truth of the gospel and the word of God to a lost world, is this true in my life individually? I mean, when it's all said and done, does it really matter that you lived on the planet or not? When it's all said and done, who cares? Does it really matter that you breathed air for umpteen years? Because you see, again, God isn't here to be our utilitarian genie. We're here to glorify him. We're here to bring honor to him. And when all is said and done in the book of Revelation, you know what it's going to tell us? Jesus Christ wins. Where you see different, it's all about Jesus Christ. And that's why if you are walking with the Lord and filled with the Spirit, you will be thinking in terms of, for me, to me to live is Christ. To die is gain. For it's all about Jesus Christ, and rightfully so. For he is King of kings, he is Lord of lords, he is Lord of the church, he is the Messiah of Israel, he is the judge of the world, and on a personal level, he loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. Do you know anyone else like that? Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Oh, may we be blessed by reading this book. May we be blessed by listening to it. May we be blessed by taking it to heart. And I pray, Father, that we would take it to heart. I pray, Father, even when it comes to our fears and concerns with the upcoming election, and even the direction our nation is going and the world is going, Oh, may we have our eyes on you. Be reminded, you say, do not be afraid. That you are our refuge. You are our source of comfort. And Father, we know that life could dramatically change in our lifetime, and if not in ours, in our children's or our grandchildren's, if the Lord Jesus doesn't come again. We know that that could be true. But we thank you that while things may change economically, things could change politically, things could change socially, things could change financially, we know that you never change. And you never leave us, and you never forsake us. And you give us the grace to deal with whatever situation. And Father, as I think of even the early church, hearing the book of Revelation, under Roman Empire oppression, with Growing persecution. What a source of comfort and encouragement it would be to them to know that their Savior lives, to know that one day he will reign, to know that in the meantime he's walking in the midst of the churches, knowing that he's saying, also, be not afraid. Thank you for this encouragement and this hope. And Lord, how can we ever thank you enough that you love us? How can we ever thank you enough that you washed us from our sins in your own blood? We just praise you for that. And we love you because of it. And by your grace, your love motivates us to want to live for you who died for us. And Father, we thank you for a book like this that reminds us of the big pictures we get stuck with just the small things of life, you know, changing diapers, as it were, when there's such a bigger picture that we need to have, a bigger perspective than raking our leaves as winter's coming. And so we pray, dear Father, that we would live life each day with a big picture, that we would remember who you are, we would remember who your son is, we remember who we are in Christ, we remember why we're here and why we're living. And then we remember that your word is true and can be trusted. And 
we'd remember that Jesus Christ is coming again. And we, we remember it could be today. We know that every man that has this hope in him purifies himself even as he is pure. But lastly, Father, my prayer goes out to those loved ones of ours, those friends of ours, those family members, those we come in contact with, perhaps even those here tonight who have never yet been saved. And I think even back of that visual of that cross bridging earth and heaven, people falling into the flames. I'm reminded how unnecessary and unneeded that is. If you're not willing that any should perish, and that we have the message of salvation to proclaim to them. Oh, may we do so with compassion and with clarity. And may your Holy Spirit use great conviction to bring them to an understanding of the finished work of Christ. And how by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, they could be saved and yet to Oh, may they see their need of salvation, the truth of the gospel, and be convinced, persuaded, so as to trust in Christ as Savior. We pray to that end now, in Jesus' name. Wow, that was the grace of God, wasn't it? Got through all of that in time. So, well, we spared you tonight presidential commercials for something far more important. And so, uh, thank you for coming. I invite you to join us this Sunday for our 8 o'clock or 1045 worship service and our 930 class. And also, Lord willing, next Wednesday night, Jesus Christ doesn't return, that uh, we'll be looking at Revelations 2 and 3. You may want to read ahead. We're going to go on a jet tour of the seven churches and make some applications relative to our lives. So thank you. With, and with that, you're dismissed.